On this edition of Native Report, we travel to Denver, Colorado, where we learn about the history and mission of the American Indian College Fund. We then head to Denver Indian Center, Inc., and learn how the center meets the unique needs and challenges faced by Denver's Native community. While we're in Denver, we visit the Denver Indian Health and Family Services, Inc., the only urban Indian health facility in a five-county area. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Only 14% of Native Americans have a college degree, and the American Indian College Fund hopes to increase that number. They do so by investing in Native students and tribal college education to transform lives and communities. Join us now as we learn about the history and mission of the American Indian College Fund. The American Indian College Fund is an organization that creates access to post-secondary education opportunities for American Indians. Founded in 1989, the American Indian College Fund has been the nation's largest charity supporting Native student access to higher education for 30 years. They do so by awarding scholarships, and the need is there now more than ever. American Indians are seriously underserved by higher education in this country. Uh, right now, about 14% of American Indian Alaska Native peoples have a college degree compared to over 30% of the general population. So there's a huge equity gap there. Uh, so the College Fund does a lot of work to uh, address that. It also expands beyond scholarships, services that help students stay in school and have success. The College Fund is successful because the tribal colleges are successful, right? So the tribal colleges are place-based institutions. The majority of them are chartered by their tribes to serve as post-secondary institutions in place-based communities. There are currently 38 members of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Um, the College Fund serves 35 of them. We've given out over $100 million worth of scholarships to probably over 100,000 students. We serve around 5,000 students a year with scholarships and um, other kinds of direct services. But there are between 17 and 20,000 students at the tribal colleges, so you know, that's uh, another big gap that needs to be filled is to find the resources to serve those other 10 to 12,000 students. The College Fund has 52 employees, and while the overall mission is to invest in students and tribal colleges to transform lives and communities, their core mission is to provide opportunity, and they do that through their student success services. We provide the path for students to learn about college going through our Native Pathways program, where students we reach out to and work with individual students and with schools and with families to help students see that they can have a post-secondary experience. We're providing some bridge programming because so many of our young people need help getting ready for college. So we're teaching them things like, you know, how to write an essay or how to navigate math when they might not know uh, sufficient math. So we have two kinds of scholarships. We have full circle. Full circle scholarships are criteria-based scholarships. So let's say uh, a corporation or an individual want to give scholarships to students who are interested in health from the state of Minnesota. We can work with them to do that. Um, 
but we also have a pretty large program that is uh, scholarships that are from individuals mostly who are just interested in supporting education for indigenous peoples and those funds go to the tribal colleges directly and then they award them in scholarships to students kind of based on their own criteria which is usually um, need. Uh, when I came to the college fund, it was clear to me that more research needed to be done about the successes of our students and the successes of tribal colleges and to be able to tell our story. You know, when people invest in you, they want to know that their investment had a return and sometimes the narrative isn't enough. Sometimes they want the quantitative information. They want to know how many people graduated. So we realized we needed to do that kind of work. But also, I've worked in the tribally controlled education movement my whole life, and we are extremely successful educating Native peoples, but people don't know that. Other areas of research include early childhood education, Native arts and culture, and environmental sustainability, to name a few program areas the College Fund is involved with. Fellowships are another offering. We are actually the biggest producer of Native PhDs. So we give fellowships to um, tribal college faculty to finish their PhDs. And I want to say we've had around 40 Native people get their PhDs. We also do a ton of um, outreach, you know, social media. Uh, public education. We produce uh, some of the best assets, I think, around telling story uh, about tribal education and tribal people, and we participate with a lot of national work. You know, we're just constantly out there uh, advocating and promoting the tribal colleges and promoting education access for Native students. We have a very unique board of trustees, the College Fund does, in Indian Country. We have a currently 21 member board, 11 of whom are tribal college presidents, and 10 of whom are private sector. I'd like the American Indian College Fund to be able to fully fund the gap that Native students have at the tribal colleges between their funding availability and their need. I've personally witnessed the impact of an education on people's lives and on the transformation that occurs in our communities. And I think every tribe should get to have a tribal college. Every tribe that wants that should get to have that. Founded in 1989, the American Indian College Fund has been the nation's largest charity supporting Native higher education for 30 years. The College Fund believes education is the answer and provided 5,896 scholarships in 2019 to Native American students. With nearly 137,000 scholarships and community support totaling over $208 million since its inception. The College Fund also supports a variety of academic and support programs at the nation's 35 accredited tribal colleges and universities, which are located on or near Indian reservations ensuring students have the tools to graduate and succeed in their careers. Otitis media, or middle ear infection, is a common problem. We most often see this in children, and three out of four will have at least one middle ear infection by age three. The ear is divided into three parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear is the pinna and the ear canal. This is the part where otitis externa, or swimmer's ear, happens. The inner ear is encased in the bony part of the skull and is where balance and the neurologic part of hearing happen. The middle ear is just behind the eardrum and is an air-filled cavity with three tiny bones called the ossicles and the eustachian tube that goes to the back of the throat. The ossicles transmit the movement of the eardrum to be sensed by the inner ear. Those signals, in turn, are sent to the brain and interpreted as sound. The eustachian tube allows pressure in the middle ear to be balanced, and the tube opens and closes several times per minute. Otitis media happens when the eustachian tube isn't draining well, and fluid builds up in the middle ear and gets infected. 
In acute otitis media, this usually happens relatively quickly and signs and symptoms of infection can include fussiness and irritability, ear pain and tugging at the ears, fever, and balance difficulties. This is generally treated with antibiotics and should be rechecked in about six weeks as it can take that long for the fluid to resolve. Otitis media with effusion is when mucus and fluid persist after an infection resolves. This may cause a feeling of fullness or decreased hearing and sometimes it has no symptoms. Chronic otitis media with effusion is when fluid stays in the middle ear for a long time or returns again and again even though there is no infection. This can be difficult to treat and may affect hearing. Otitis media is diagnosed with an otoscope, which has a bright light and a small funnel to allow visualization of the eardrum. Sometimes ear tubes are recommended. These are inserted by a specialist, and this is done under anesthesia. A small incision is made in the eardrum, and the fluid is drained out, and a small tube is inserted into the incision. As the eardrum heals, the tube eventually gets pushed out. Ear tubes are generally in place for 6 to 12 months or so. Some kids need to have special tubes in that stay in if they continue to get infections. Most kids will outgrow ear infections as the eustachian tube gets bigger as they grow. As always, your health care provider can answer questions. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and this is Health Matters. Oftentimes, when a native individual or family move to a new urban setting, they seek out the local Indian center, knowing it is a place to socialize and be with other native people. Since 1983, Denver Indian Center, Inc. has proven to be crucial in meeting the needs of the native community. Based on our mission statement, what we want to do is, is approach the community from a standpoint of, of self-determination, self-reliance, not a handout, but a hand up. 15 minutes southwest of downtown Denver, Colorado, is Denver Indian Center, Inc. And on this morning, co-executive director Rick Waters is preparing some notes for a meeting off-site. We're in an old, as you can see, a little old school building. And this was given to us by the city in 1985. Uh, the Denver Indian Center was founded in 1983, and prior to that, it was an organization that came together just to meet some of the needs that uh, were, were surfacing for our Indian community here. That evolved into the Denver Indian Center. It's become kind of a landmark or uh, uh, a location that most Indian people are familiar with. And often just by our name, the Denver Indian Center, when uh, Indian people, Natives come into Denver and they're looking for answers to questions, you know, even where to eat, sometimes they'll give us a, give us a call. Denver is one of the, the original relocation cities from the Relocation Act in the 50s and 60s. But based on census count, and this is a lot of the self-identification, uh, it's estimated there are approximately 50,000, 40 to 50,000 uh, American Indians and descendants here in the Denver Front Range area, approximately 60,000 in the state of Colorado. Denver, I, I tell people, Denver's considered in, in many circles a crossroads of Indian country. On this morning, activity at the center was minimal due to another event held off-site. However, staff were still on hand for any clients who wished to access some of the services provided by the center. From the standpoint of um, what services we provide, I think you go back originally. It was you know the relocation uh, people when they when people moved here. Obviously, you need jobs, you need a place to stay, uh, you need to to fulfill those needs of being social, uh, interaction with others that you're familiar with. So I think originally. Uh, the workforce program or job opportunities was kind of the, the, the key opportunity. Now, uh, that's evolved uh, into uh, a career service workforce program to, uh, funded by the Department of Labor that we do offer. Uh, the other program that we have is more of a life skills, and that's the fatherhood program. Some of our last cohorts and, and groups have been uh, made up almost 50% uh, of women or moms. Uh, with the with the thought being, you know, they said I'm a single mom. 
but I'm raising my sons and I want to know if there's anything else I can do uh, to help them as they grow. We do offer a food bank here. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, youth programs, uh, both after school, summer, we've had preschool, we've offered GED classes. And I say in the past because we're nonprofits, so we rely on donations, sponsorships, uh, grants, and uh, despite the economic and social ups and downs that uh, we go through, uh, we're still here and we're, we're hoping that uh, we're kind of on that upward trend now to provide more uh, direct services to our, our community members. We are uh, currently researching and looking for funding uh, that can support programs that will uh, allow our elders to come here uh, and get involved, stay active. Right now we have a, a dedicated room to our elders and we have people that come in there and they work on arts and crafts or they come in and read or they just come in there to be with others and socialize throughout the day. We do have a gymnasium and, and that's kind of the, the centerpiece of this center. We host powwows. Uh, we uh, have hosted uh, funerals, um, wake services, trainings, uh, uh, trade fairs, job search type fairs. The gym also hosts receptions and graduations. The center's annual budget is $1 million. And like all nonprofits, the center relies upon foundation grants, corporate donations, and individual gifts. We're funded primarily by our two major programs, uh, and those are federally funded, so you know that puts us in a little bit of uh, uh, issue of making sure that you know we're on top of things. An average day here at the Indian Center is first opening the door and you have a schedule of events, but once the door opens, you never know what's going to come through. The, the challenges are is obviously trying to get and accommodate what the community needs and wants with the resources that you have. We often are asked, what's the biggest challenge that you face? And probably it's the invisibility of our, our people, our community. But we are unique, we are, we persevered through all these years. And so that's the biggest challenge that we face as a center, but I think even beyond Denver, that's, that's an issue that uh, a lot of the urban areas, uh, Indian centers have encountered. We do have a lot of American Indian presence in our community, but the tribes are very far away from us and in the corner. So for the young people who are here, they don't, they're not reminded that they're Indian people here in the community. Like when you go, when I go home to New Mexico, it's like entering Santa Ana Indian Reservation, into entering Santo Domingo, entering, you know, Arizona, you see entering this reservation, entering this reservation. Here you don't see that. So for them, it's an opportunity for them to start recognizing this is Indian homelands. You are Indian. How, is, how do you see this? What's your perspective of this? And that's what I think uh, is so interesting and, and so energizing for the young people here to start to think that way, to help change that narrative of Indian people, who you are, how are you going to voice yourself? Next, although Denver Indian Health and Family Services, Inc. is centrally located within Indian Country and many national Indian organizations are headquartered in Denver, it is isolated from tribal health and Indian health services. The clinic works to fill that gap and serve as the medical home for Native Americans in the Denver area. They are a whole family clinic combining Western medicine with Native expertise. The city of Denver, Colorado is home to nearly 50,000 Native Americans, representing at least 200 Native nations. The nearest reservation clinic is seven hours away, which is why the urban Native American community in and around the city utilize Denver Indian Health and Family Services, Inc. for healthcare and other social programs. We were formed in 1978 and we were located on Vine Street, which is in the downtown area by City Park. 
and we were there for several years and then we relocated over to the southwest area uh, for several of those years I want to say about nine years we were there um, from that point we relocated in 2007 and went to the city park area where we originally started and we were there for another 10 years then the last nine months we relocated over here it was a lot of work you know we had to really go through the 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 city of denver has changed you know the property values have gone sky high and we were really worried that we wouldn't find a space and we just were very for fortunate that we found mercy housing and they really helped us with this effort we were embraced by a lot of the uh, organizations here in, in Denver, all of us on the board, have wanted to see it grow and be able to have something of our own. We have uh, wanted to have uh, a facility that uh, was in Indian Health and Family Services. The clinic provides a variety of on-site services such as primary care, a dental clinic, a pharmacy, behavioral health, and diabetes care and management. They also assist clients who wish to enroll in a health insurance program. These are our main funders that helped us get to our clinic. So we've listed them all here. And on this end is our dental operatories. We have three operatories, uh, three different chairs going at the same time um, in our clinic. Then in our diabetes program, we have, a, we have two different programs going on. One is funded by the Special Diabetes Program for Indians and one through the CDC Tribal Wellness Grant. We take a very integrated care approach. Um, so we'll see folks here in our program, um, but our program is attached to the medical clinic. And so oftentimes our model is to um, jump in on a medical visit um, so that folks kind of get a little more education to go hand in hand with their new prescription or their labs. Um, or point at, you know, point of care vitals. Um, we also provide classes, so we do those um, in a group setting, um, which folks really like. And then here um, in our program, we have a, an on-site gym. Um, so our diabetes prevention specialists can work with folks one-on-one -on -one, um, to capture the fitness component. And then recently we've integrated a native wellness coordinator um, to help us really focus on some of those um, indigenous food and food ways. Um, so we're taking a more holistic approach, um, going back to some of those more traditional wisdoms um, to diabetes care and prevention. In our behavioral health department, we have four therapists that see patients. Um, one of them is a social worker um, that works within our integrated care clinic. Uh, we just transitioned to an integrated care clinic about four years ago before we were very siloed and worked within our own um, departments. On average, we see a little old, close to 2,000 patients a year, and we have seen over 10,000 visits per year. There are challenges that need to be met. Procuring funding is always at the top of the list. And even though the clinic celebrated their first year, Adrian and the board are thinking 10 years ahead. The Indian Health Care Improvement Act was also approved at the same time as uh, the Affordable Care Act. And in there, um, the urban clinics have a special um, section. And in that section of the law, it allows us to access property. And we're the only nonprofit that, Native American nonprofit, that is eligible to do so. Within our clinic, we are already at capacity, even though we just moved here. But we couldn't find a location that was big enough, that gives you enough space to grow. So now we have to think creatively. How do we expand our program without you know, outgrowing the infrastructure? So one of the things f that we're looking at uh, for, 2000, uh, for 2018 and 19 is uh, improving the quality of our health clinic, making sure that we're following OSHA regulations. You can get so caught up in all of the regulations of running a healthcare clinic that it would be easy to lose focus of our cultural identity. But that is the focus of what we're doing. And so we make sure that we are bringing that into everything that we do. 
You know, we're here to serve all, all families. We base everything on a, on a poverty scale. So whether they're low or high on that scale, we are welcoming all of our families to come in and use this as their medical home because we're not just seeing low income families, we're seeing families from all, you know, from all income categories. So we welcome anybody to come in through our doors. Healthcare for Indians is, is something that I think has not been the best, uh, even on the reservations. Some of our healthcare facilities have not provided the best of care. And so I just want it to be a part of something that uh, we could improve and improve more and do well for the people in the Denver Indian community. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors across Indian country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. <laughs>